Well, welcome everybody to another edition of Roll the Bones Around the Cage with Grizzly and Gumshoe Val. Welcome to the show, Missy, Sean, Denise, Rocket. Boy, do we got a show for you tonight. Yeah. Unbelievable. What's going on, Val? Coming to you live from cloudy, cold, chilly, rainy Michigan. 55 degrees. I'm wonderful. Yeah. Doing fine. I'm glad to hear that. Welcome back, everybody. Missy, Sean, Denise. I'm glad to have you, man. Ladies and gentlemen. Well, what a show do we have for you. Uh, Val, the other night, I got to see Bigfoot cloak like Predator. So that was very interesting. That uh, actually caught me off guard. So we actually had that video live. Uh, yeah, I'd like to on look at that. One of my shows. Uh, like we're to actually going to rebroadcast that Wednesday. Mm -hmm. uh, I will get a hold of that video. They try to debunk this video. I mm -hmm. couldn't tell you how many times uh, they said it was aliens. They said it was a squirrel being uh, abducted by aliens. I mean, they tried everything, ladies and gentlemen, but they could not figure out what it was and it looked just like the movie predator hmm. uh yeah sean it's 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 cold in virginia too rainy yeah uh texas shoots hello chris chris actually seen the video did you chris i think chris recorded it off his cell phone uh very interesting it makes a lot of sense ladies and gentlemen why we can't see things but we hear things so, yes, Chris, indeed. Yeah. So, uh, very interesting, Val. So, what do you, what, what do we have tonight? Well, today we're going to talk to a gentleman from Michigan, good old Michigan. And oh, he, bring, Go ahead, he, Val. he brings a interesting uh, case forward. Now, anybody that's familiar with my group site, I, I post literally hundreds of threads, mainly, mostly um, interesting topic subjects, all Bigfoot related. One in particular is gifting and baiting. The ills and, and uh, problems and issues that, that uh, confront people, both people that uh, do the baiting and do the gifting and the fallout the side effects, the, the people that uh, aren't involved with this, that are um, brought into this uh, Bigfoot issue by what the What is wrong with it, Val? What is the big deal? So what? So, Somebody gives Bigfoot, okay? What is the big deal? Come on, man. So a lot with Dr. Ivan Pavlov, when he, when he started looking at dogs, if you, for those of us that are familiar with the psychology of uh, Ivan Pavlov's study of classical conditioning, theory of classical conditioning, he, he promotes and, and offers a theory that, uh, that animals, in particular dogs, can be trained to react to different things, different elements of conditioning. In this case, uh, with gifting and Bigfoots, you give them food, and that's a that's a lifelong endeavor to them. You can't give up. You think you 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 hold the terms. It's not right. They do. They tell you when enough is enough. And so tonight, um, uh, 
this gentleman agreed to come on and share his his stories about gifting, what he's seen, what he's experienced. And I think it'll be good for everybody, Grizz. So you're telling me, do not feed the stray cats in the neighborhood. Is that what you're saying? Because well, they keep coming back for more and more? Just like bears, we don't we don't want to feed bears in the parks. We don't want to feed seagulls and everything else. Uh, we listen to this guy's story, and um, I think everybody can can draw their own conclusion from it. All right. Well, we have him backstage, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and bring him on, Brian. Welcome to the show here. Let me make sure I hit the right button and bring you on. Welcome, welcome. Hello there, sir. How you doing? Good. How are you? Wonderful. Welcome to the show. Uh, Thank you. Why don't you tell us all about yourself and a little bit of history? Uh, well, I've had Bigfoot in the brain since the late to mid-70s because we grew up around a farm where I'm going to take my glasses off because I'm going to get choked up during this. Uh, my grandma had Bigfoot activity on the farm. And so the very first time I saw that in search of with Leonard Nimoy, I was sitting with my dad and they, they played the Patterson Gilman film. And I pointed right. to the TV and I said, is that, is that what's that grandma's? And he's like, yep, that's that grandma's. Whoa. So, and just a little, so it's, clear there was one my grandpa was a deputy at the time he was working nights and one night during a thunderstorm they had a dog who would chase bears out of the barn even though there weren't supposed to be bears in the barn in the mid-70s in lake ann and one night the dog came running through the house jumped under the bed and would not come out and so my grandma was looking and out of the window there was a flash of lightning and a huge shadow filled that window so she grabbed the shotgun, called my grandpa. He came out with the cavalry, with the deputies. And there was a 17-inch track outside that window that they cast. And there is a report on it in Benzie County. So, and then the wow. track went off into the woods. So I kind of grew up with big, knowing that Bigfoot was around. The first experience I had was in 1987, about two miles from there. I like to take late night drives. It's about midnight i'm coming up and i'm seen by the guard row it looks like a huge bag of garbage and i thought well what a piece of trash do we leave in a big bag of garbage on the road you know and as right. i get closer it looks like a round bag a very big round bag of garbage so i'm thinking oh that's a bear i'm gonna get to see a really big bear and i stop within 20 feet with my high beams on and then this bear stands up and squares off to my car and I had a 1979 El Camino and its shoulders were as wide as the car. And I, I don't want to be too graphic, but it was junk was just about on top of my hood. And what seemed like an eternity, it was probably maybe five seconds, but I went to hit the horn, hoping to scare this thing off. But something in my mind said, if you hit that horn, he's going to peel you out of this car like a tuna fish. And then wow. all of a sudden it just stepped over the guardrail and was gone. And I never told that story because in the 80s, that was not a cool thing to do. <laughs> you know, if you saw Bigfoot, you were absolutely bonkers. I'm trying to watch the language. So much so to the fact that there was a very popular sheriff in Benzie County in the mid 80s named Zane Gray. Mm -hmm. Extremely popular. He saw a Bigfoot and made a report. The very next election, they used that to vote him out. Said he oh, wasn't yeah. Confident. So... He lost his job because he stood up for the truth in that matter. Now, to get to the gifting part, uh, a friend of mine told me about this area, and I went out there in 2019, and did, I expected to get skunked. You know, it's my first time out. What are the odds? I'm actually going to find something. And so I walk about a mile down this trail. It was in January. And I take a picture of the hillside. I thought, well, if anybody's going to be watching, that would be the place to watch. And as I go up to watch this hillside, I had a friend with me who was a total non-believer. Thought I was just crazy, but wanted to go for a ride. As I'm walking up the hill, I had been clapping on the way to down. Because I'm kind of shy. I don't want to be screaming, yelling, howling, all that stuff. So I would clap twice, nothing. 
I clapped twice. I started to go up the hill and something that sounded like two catchers had been hitting together came back twice. Froze me in my tracks. I looked at her. She's got tears in her eyes. I said, you know, it takes hands to clap, right? And she's like, yeah, I want to go. I said, okay, we're going to go. And as we're walking up the hill, all of a sudden we're starting to hear tree knocks. You'd hear a whoop. We're about halfway back to the car, which is about another half mile. And all of a sudden the gate by my car is rattling. And I'm like, crap, they're ahead of us and behind us. We are done. You know, I don't know what to expect at this point. But we make it to the car, drive off. And it was probably six months before I got the, the nerve to go back. So, and I, my friend looked at that picture that I had taken of the hill. And you can see the eyes of a Sasquatch looking back through the tree at me. So the only reason it clapped was because I started to walk toward it. Wow. And, you know, I still got the picture. You can see the brow ridge and the snow on top of the eyes and the deep sockets looking through the tree branch. So wow. after six months, we go out and, I'm, you know, we're starting to see, I'm seeing the tree structures and stuff, which is really cool. And I don't even know, I think I was on Val's site and I saw about the idea of gifting. And I thought, well, this is within my control. You know, this isn't going to happen to me, all these other horror stories. You know, I can do this. And so I would start leaving stuff. Um, I had two friends who would go with me. One's passed on now. But like we would leave peanut butter jars and we would leave colored popsicle sticks. We'd put the colored popsicle sticks jumbled under the peanut butter jar. And then we'd go back like a week later and the peanut butter jar would be gone, but the sticks were all laid out by color. You know, so I, I would take before and after pictures. So I got pictures of what it would look like before and what it would like after. And then when sometimes we'd find the peanut butter jar maybe 50 feet away, you know, lit clean or wash clean, whatever. However, they were clean spotless. And even got to the point where I left a, a friend of mine had painted a rock with their name on it. And so we put it by one of the stations and I came back and the rock was gone. I went, huh. So we walked around and another mile away at another peanut butter station was the rock with the name face up. Sitting where the peanut butter jar should have been. So and then that was a picture I had taken and sent to Val. And this is how Val and I started talking was he started looking at these pictures for me. He was very kind and very gracious about it. And he's like, well, there's a track there that you missed. And then off and to the left, there's one looking at you over a log. And I never would have seen it, but, I, you know, I still got those pictures. Well, as this progresses, you know, now we're finding peanut jar with the lid screwed back on. There's not a bite mark, not a claw mark. Sometimes we're finding the peanut butter jars eight feet up in the tree. Sometimes we're finding them with the tinfoil like carefully unwrapped, rolled up, and then put in the jar with the lid back on it. Uh, I went out there several times at night, had some crazy experiences, got some thermal, you know, tree peakers. And, I mean, every weekend I would go out there, I'd find something. Wow. Like, there was any time I'd get stuck. We even found a pathway that they used because you would find multiple tracks. Uh where they had gone up and down through this valley way. You know, but there's so much leaf and stuff, there wasn't much to cast. And one night I did go to cast one and we had put peanut butter out. We decided to go to a different spot. I found this beautiful 18 inch print. And it was my first time trying to cast it. And I screw it up. I'm like, God dang it. So then I went, I was so mad. I went back and uh, the peanut butter jar was already gone. And this was at night, so it's like they're within feet of me. We put a recorder out one night, and as I'm taping this recorder to a road sign, you know, I've got the recorder going, all of a sudden you hear the road, something hit the road sign. You know, bang, and you hear me curse because it scared me. It's like, that's a rock. And then a couple seconds later, you hear another rock hit a tree. And then so we leave, and my friend Lance goes through this recording, and for like an hour and a half from about midnight to 2.30 in the morning out in the middle of the woods, you can hear tree breaks. You can hear like knocking and you can hear almost like a, they call it that little samurai chatter in a deep voice. Yeah. 
so you know this he's sending me these clips of the recordings and i'm only halfway through at this point from what i was doing so i keep gifting you know because i'm getting responses i'm going to keep i'm putting out six jars of peanut butter a week wow and they're all disappearing well uh, it turned out that one part of the property that i thought was private or i'm sorry was public property turned out to be private and so the people who owned it talked to me and were very nice very sweet they could have been real jerks about private property i mean they could have really let me have it and i would have deserved it but they're like you know we don't like them coming up to our house you know so you need to we don't care what you do on that side of the road this is our house this is our home what do you we mean they what they what is not, they we I tried to dance around that topic with them for 20 minutes. And this was a year ago. And I finally said, because when they asked me about the peanut butter, they're like, oh, are you out here trapping something, porcupine? I said, okay, well, you found my peanut butter. Did you ever see any traps out here? And they're like, well, no. I said, well, here's what I've got. And I showed them pictures of the tracks. And at that point, I had a 23-inch track that I found. Whoa. So here's a picture of this. Here's a picture of one hiding in the woods. And the guy looked at it and he's like, yep, that's not Wilt Chamberlain, is it? <laughs> nope. So they knew what I was doing, but they would not commit to what that was. And they're like, well, we talked to everybody. You know, as long as you stay on that side of the road, you're fine. So this goes on for another year and a half. And I'm still having all kinds of cool stuff happen. But I start getting lazy. Instead of walking, you know, two miles down because it's a seasonal road. So winter access is tough. So I start baiting, gifting, however you want to phrase it, much closer. And this, and I'm going to get choked up here because everything that happened now is because of me at this point. So I was consistent for two and a half years out there. A few weeks ago, um, I had some family issues. I had some health issues. So I missed about four weeks. And out of the blue my friend who would go out occasionally with me they um there were cameras up and got her license plate number and within three days contacted her that they wanted to talk to me the dnr at this point so That's i call the it department DNR, right? of natural resources right yeah mm -hmm. yep yep the conservation officer wanted to talk to me they made it very clear that she wasn't in trouble but they needed to talk to me so I called back right away, got a voicemail. So I waited till Monday. And then she and I, I had quite a interesting conversation because she wanted to, she says, well, you know what this is about? And I'm like, yeah, she says, you can't be feeding them. You can't be feeding the wildlife out there. The wildlife are harassing the residents are coming closer to their homes. And I'm like, okay. And she said, you know, and the bears are coming out of the dens and this is the issue. Bears? Yeah, they said the bears, and I've been out there, and at that point, I said, is this conversation being recorded? And she's like, no. I said, okay, well, I'm going to tell you right now, bears don't leave 23-inch tracks, they don't throw rocks at me, and they don't hit my truck with a log from the middle of the woods. And she's don't like, well, excuse me? <laughs> I went, no, that's it right there. And she says, well, there is the issue of littering, there is the issue of feeding wildlife, you know, you, you, you can't be doing this. Where you're at is technically private property because it's owned by a company. They don't want to kick you out. They just want you to stop what they're doing because of the fact they're harassing the residents. They are harassing the yep. residents. I, I tried my that. best to get her to say Bigfoot Sasquatch somehow because then she wanted to see the trail, my trail cam pictures. I'm like, well, I don't put trail cams out because I'm afraid somebody will you know, take the trail cam. Well, you got some pictures on your phone, so can we see those? And I went, no, it's just your typical non-convincing blob squatch and some un, you know, I don't want them looking at my phone. <laughs> it's like, right. They're not going to come out and tell me what I want to know. I'm not going to give them everything they want to know either. Right. She's like, well, you just need to go and clean everything. And she did mention the fact that they had been picking up my jars because I wonder where some of them went. I try to keep an accurate count. I date them. I put locations on them and I didn't find them for a while. And this was, this happened after I'd missed four weeks out there, mind you. 
And after that four weeks, this wasn't the DNR got called because the neighbors called the DNR. She says, you, do you want to know how I got involved? I says, well, you got my name and I had given the neighbors my name and number. So I know how you got involved with me. And she's like, right. So, you know, we, we need you to go out there and clean them up and quit doing it. And I'm like, absolutely no problem. She was a very pleasant person. This could have went a hundred different ways. I think she was trying to feel me out to see if I was going to be a jerk about it. And likewise, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen. So, so I, as I'm out there, been out there the last two weeks cleaning them up, uh, yesterday was the first time that I got a lot of action while I was cleaning up. You know, I, had, I went down to an area that I hadn't been down in a year. And within a five minute walk, I see something step out that's much bigger than I am and go up the hill. It was gone in just a few seconds. So I'm like, sure enough, they're here, you know, because I clap when I get there. So, you know, it's me. And I carry a green backpack. You know, as somebody mentioned, that's kind of a way to identify. You're supposed to wear the same shirt, you know, clothes. So I just carry a green backpack. And is it usually and, filled with peanut butter? Yeah, usually it's filled with peanut butter. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I still have two left over jars. But yeah. Um, so we do hear a couple tree knocks as we're walking down and then I glance over to my left and there's one I call big red. And the only reason why I know he is red because during a prior experience out there, I was putting my peanut butter out and normally I would clap when I leave the peanut butter. But one time I jingle my keys and then you can hear something go crashing through the woods like a bulldozer. I come out and look and, just going over the hill off the bluff where my truck is, is a set of huge red and shoulders and head going over the hill. And I'm like, well, what the heck? You know, I missed it. You know, I only use my phone camera. And this was hilarious because I'm up there and I'm thinking, where did I leave? I had a cream soda. I only have an a and cream soda once in a blue moon because I'm trying to lose weight. I went, crap, I left my cream soda on my bumper and go to look and you can see a track right next to my bumper and my cream soda is gone. So I jingle in the keys, must have scared it, and it takes off of my pop over the hill. So anyway, I see those two red legs walk, take about three steps up the hill and gone when I'm down going to clean yesterday. And as on the way down, there was nothing. It was kind of rainy, so the microphone I had couldn't pick any of this up. All it's here, and it's rain off my shoulders. And... On the way back, there were a few more tree knocks. I took some shots over my shoulder because I knew they were watching. You know, you get that hair on the back of your neck that just stands up. And But, I, uh, you know, I kept my word. I, would, I didn't clean any peanut butter up. But on the way up, in the middle of the path, I found, like, little strips of pine or wood or something put right in the middle of my path that wasn't there when I walked out. So I took a picture of it and you can see much tinier footprints go across. Like, look how close we got and you didn't know it because the chip, wood chips were dry. And there were two piles. So we start walking a little farther up. I do a couple claps, we get a tree knock back. And then as we get almost to the truck, I find a peanut butter jar. Was not there when I walked down there. And the jar was dated 1-8 of 23 barrel, which was, I used to put them in a burn barrel, and that was about a mile plus away. Jar was not there when I walked down. You know, it was right there next to the path. So I get in my truck. as I forgot something, so I get out of my truck, and all of a sudden, like a crack of thunder, I hear the loudest tree knock I have ever heard without a tree snap. You know, there's a big difference. You, so you guys know there's a difference between a huge knock and a, and a tree snap. A snap's like right. a gunshot right. and knocks wood on wood. And it was like Barry Bonds turned 12 feet tall and hit something with the Louis, though. And this is one of the days that you didn't leave any peanut butter. Yep, this was yesterday when I did not leave peanut butter. And the so, more I thought about it, the more I thought that's their way of saying, okay, now we're mad because we know what's in your bag and you didn't give it to us. Mm-hmm. So back to the house, the the residents living near this conservatory, what was the issue that they were experiencing, Brian? So when on my way down 
two, the two of the neighbors who I had talked to a year prior were standing by the road waiting for me. And I get out and they seem you know, like, we're so sorry we had to do this. We're sorry I had to come to this. And I'm like, that's okay. You know, I, I totally get it. I did this for two and a half years. I didn't think I'd get away with it this long. And she's like, well, you know, we know we said if you stayed on that side of the road, it's fine. And she said, and we kept track of when you were coming and going. So we knew when, you know, we know Sunday's your day. We know Wednesday's the night you come out, you know, and do your night thing. And Saturday nights you come do your night thing. So they're very aware of who's going in or not. And I talked to him. They said, you missed a couple of weeks. And I'm like, yeah. And she says, well, after the first week, about three days in, which would have been 10 days, mm-hmm. she says, everybody started finding more peanut butter jars in their yard. <laughs> so they're finding empty peanut butter jars in their yard. Yep. That, that is worked. a hint, ladies and gentlemen. Yep. That's what I like, take it at. There you go. So, you know, because... You know, the ringmaster forgot to leave the peanut butter. They were going after the lion tamer and everybody else to get the ringmaster back to put peanut butter out. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'll go get the jars, whatever. And she's like, no, we already turned those over to the DNR. She says, when it became a real issue is when, and she pointed down the road to the neighbors, they started having them peek in their windows. Motion lights were going on and off. That's the line that, that doesn't get crossed with a lot of people. Yep. And as soon as that started to happen was when they called the DNR. Because and that's that's the problem yeah. that we see in, in now I would love Val to hear that conversation, being a neighbor, calling the DNR. I got a neighbor that's feeding Sasquatch and they are pissed off because he is not feeding them peanut butter no more. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine being a fly on that wall hearing that conversation? Well, when they refuse to call it what it is or they cannot explain it, they usually call it bears. Bears are, is the tacit word used now uh, by authorities to explain Sasquatch and Bigfoot. They're never going to say Sasquatch, a Sasquatch and a Bigfoot. So picture in your mind, if you will, a bear walking on two legs, carrying an empty peanut butter jar, leaving it in somebody's yard, then walking over to the window with the claws and peeping the window, you know, maybe knocking on the, on the wall, maybe knocking on the window. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. But this is the issue that we have with baiting and uh, gifting, as it's called in some corners. And I see this all the time. In fact, I sent I sent you today, Brian, a uh, report out of New Jersey, of all places. There, a similar situation. Um, and, and what is the center of this? Bigfoot's gifting and peanut butter. The problem that they had, the same thing. Peeping in windows, pounding on walls. Standing outside the house, screeching, scaring the good folk inside. But this is it. This is the nature of baiting and gifting. So they were me. actually harassing Bron, your neighbors? Not my neighbors, the uh, because I live about an hour away. Mm-hmm. But they were harassing the people who live there. Mm-hmm. Wow. So, and this is where I get choked up because. I don't want anything bad to happen to anybody. I don't want anything bad to happen to the Bigfoot that are there. And now I've created a conflict by feeding them and by missing time. And now these Bigfoot are upset, obviously, because they're not getting what they want. Mm -hmm. So now they're going to innocent bystanders who have done their best to stay out of this whole mess and giving them a hard time. I'm only there two days a week. They have to live there. Mm-hmm. knowing what's I mean there's been air uh I'm sorry there has been activity in that area for decades mm-hmm. there's that been is true. Sasquatch Chronicles about people talking about it back in the mid 80s that is true a mile from where I'm at mm-hmm. so these people are just trying to live their lives and I was I, to be honest the only way I can phrase this is being selfish because I wanted experiences and I got lazy where I was doing it so now what's what's going to be the fallout? We already know the fallout is they're harassing the people. 
are they going to quit and everything goes back to where that delicate balance was? Or are they going to continue and something happens where they go in there and either, you know, hunt the Sasquatch or they kill them off? Or because there are hiking trails nearby, the, the Sasquatch start picking off dogs and get hurt somebody else because they're mad at me. I mean, these are the things I think about now that I didn't think about back then. And I am very remote for, for creating this mm-hmm. environment for these people. If it were just ramifications for me, you know, fine, I'll, I'll take the consequences, but it's not. I involved a whole lot of innocent people in this mm-hmm. that did not want to be involved. Now, now, didn't you say that one of these neighbors close by posted their house for sale, their property for sale? Yeah, one across. Uh, it's nobody I had talked to, mm-hmm. but they were directly across the road on the main road. And I had actually heard them probably two months ago. I was actually sitting there laughing because you would hear a, a couple of whoops from the woods and then that person's dog would start barking mm-hmm. and that dog would go off. And then as soon as the dog would quit, you'd hear a couple more whoops to get the dog going back again. Mm-hmm. And this went on for a half an hour easily. And then finally that person fired the gun off and then the whoops quit. Mm-hmm. You know, and now the house is for sale. Mm-hmm. So, wow, I see I this. Know. I see this a lot in uh, in my research. A lot of times, when uh, people are angered and annoyed over this kind of thing, they don't understand it. They don't understand how this happened to them. They don't understand why it happens to them, but they do not want their children around this, and they pack up and they leave. That property goes up for sale. Somebody comes along looking for a good deal. Um, they buy it. They don't understand what they're what they're what's in store for them when they do buy it. And this is a this is a vicious circle that goes around and around and around and around. And consequently, a lot of times, what happens is, as I explained to Brian and I. I I think I talked to you about this too, Grizz, was that when people do this, <clears throat> when they start this act of <clears throat> this consecration of <clears throat> gifting Bigfoots, it's an act that that people do not thinking that they're gonna they're going to keep this up. They're not gonna stop because Bigfoot Sasquatch, they don't understand this. They don't understand the 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 the, the the idea of quitting they're there to pound on that house. They want their food. It's, it's that time they don't get it. And the neighbors are bothered by it. Ultimately what happens is uh, somebody, somebody uh, sees something peeping in the window and they react with gunfire. This is what happens or their property gets damaged or their livestock or their pets disappear and they're eaten. They're eaten and stolen. This happens over and over and over and over again with a lot of these reports. Now, this is in Michigan, right, Brian? Yeah, it's in the northern lower part. There you go, Sean. Um, And I knew they could get pretty sketchy. So that was why I was trying to be pretty vigilant about going out there. Um, Because one night, this was probably the scariest night I ever had out there was I had taken a picture with one friend and we saw two huge tracks following deer tracks up a hill and took a picture. And this is when Val got Bob Daigle involved with me a little bit, but I snapped that picture. I took my friend home. I called another friend. I said, I want to go back and follow those tracks and see what they were. And she's like, oh, all right, let's go. You know, it's 11 o'clock at night at this point. So we get back to where we could see the huge tracks in the snow and we managed to stumble our way up the hill and we don't have lights on you know we're going in the dark i'm just using a little pen light so and then we hear a branch or something break in front of us and she's like what was that i said no but i'm gonna hit the light and see so i turn on the flashlight and standing in front of us just at the edge of that beam was this huge brown eight foot plus you know, I'm just going to say Bigfoot. I know that's what it was. 
As soon as that beam hit it, it brings its arm up like this to cover its eyes, and you can see the hair hang down on the arms. And this thing roared to the point where it vibrated your whole body. I put, I turned around, I put my keys in my friend's hands because she's much shorter than I am. She was only five foot four. I put it in my hands. I says, get to the truck. If I'm not there in 30 seconds, you go. And so I'm literally pushing her through the snow, trying to get her in the truck. And you can hear whatever it is coming behind us. And she opens the door. I throw her in the truck. I slip. I fall under the truck because the roads are icy. And then I hear my truck start thinking, holy crap, she's going to run me over. And I managed to scoot to the other side. We get in the truck. We leave. And we get part ways down the road. And she's like, we got to stop at Shell. Nobody said anything for about five minutes. And I'm like, well, I ain't stopping at Shell. I'm going home. And, you know, <laughs> after that, no way. And she's like, well, I wet my pants when I roared. I'm like, oh. So luckily she had snow pants on. And right, right. So we, so we stopped and she went into Shell and put him in a bag and put him in the back. And on the way back, I said, I am so sorry. She was, I am never going back with you again out there. So I knew, and uh, I sent the picture to Val and he got Bob Daigle involved and lightened everything. And there were at least four Bigfoot in that picture. And two of them were well over 10 foot. Uh, I went back the next day and to try to reenact me going up that hill. And in their two steps, I'm six foot and um, about 270. And it took me six steps to equal those two. And they were 23 inch tracks out there. Mm -hmm. So That's I knew there huge. were big ones out there. You know, That's I forget huge. the formula of values. I think Val did the formula with the 23 and put it around 14 foot or something like that. You and take the, you take the, uh, the, the footprint length, you multiply it by 6.5, whatever your answer is, you divide it by 12 inches per foot, and that's going to give you a pretty good, pretty good uh, idea of what you're looking at, a pretty good range. Yeah, I think you mentioned it was, it turned out to be like 14 something. Yeah. And by looking in the picture from where that stood, and then I went out and took a follow up in the spring, mm -hmm. 14 looked like pretty, was cl pretty close. Mm -hmm. you know and was absolutely massive i mean people think i'm a big guy at 270 and six foot mm -hmm. but i've never considered them. after seeing something like that i mean that was two to three times bigger than me easy mm -hmm. um, so i knew things could get sketchy but i think what i did was i interrupted their dinner with that many in yeah. one picture i think i came up because they had chased that deer down because the deer tracks were next to it mm -hmm. and i think they were just over the hill with you know, because I have seen little ones out there. I played peekaboo with one for several minutes once, not in the traditional cover of my face and they cover their face, but uh, it was hiding in the bushes. And the first time it happened, it was maybe 30 seconds. I, you know, I ducked behind a tree and put my head out and it jumped back in the bush and then it jumped back forward. I jumped back behind the tree and it would do the same thing. After about 30 seconds, there was a knock and it ran off. And it was about a four footer. Next week I go out there. And in the exact same spot, I can see his face poking out at me. So I jump back behind the tree, look, and as soon as I poke my face out, it pulls back into the bush. This time it goes on for like four or five minutes. And then the tree knocking off it goes. And we have found, you know, seven and eight inch tracks, but they were pretty darn deep. So whatever it is was either a really chubby kid or just something very heavy, mm -hmm. barefoot out in the woods. So we knew there were little ones out there. You know, we got, we got this family group going and here I am. And I'm going to get choked up, getting lazy because I want I don't want to walk so far to get experience. So now I'm just going to put, put the drives a little closer along the road. They won't bother them. Like like they respect boundaries or something, I guess, you know. So now I'm dealing with trying to figure out I don't know how to fix it. I mean, obviously, by not leaving any more peanut butter. You know, I've talked to a couple other friends and they're like, they are probably pretty upset at this point. I would not do any more nighttime out there by yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, do some daytime stuff, reinforce the fact that you're not going to leave it and just try to let it work itself out, which I just hate that idea. I don't want those people going through that.
I don't want other people getting the idea. What I was doing was really cool. And then creating similar situations. Mm-hmm. Do I, uh, do I, I hate to say I regret it. I regret how I did it. Mm-hmm. I wish I could have figured out another way where it didn't involve other people. Mm-hmm. Sean, Sean, uh, a viewer asked us, uh, what are the trees there? Is it a mix? Uh, is it pine or? No, it, it's a mix. And it was really bizarre because last summer, um, there's birch, there's pine, maple, but every cherry tree got beat up out there. If you came mm-hmm. across a cherry tree, it was snapped about six feet up. I had no idea why they were picking on cherry trees, but all the other trees in the area would be absolutely fine. And then this poor little cherry tree snapped and twisted mm-hmm. about six feet up. And then we go out this year. I didn't go down into this valley where I would do, did the first year I was there. Last year I was pretty heavy, not really wanting to walk too much. Um, but then I went down this year and all the birch are beat up. All the other trees in the area are fine, but the birch trees are all beat up for some reason. Birch yeah. is my favorite tree, by the way. It smells oh, I love birch delicious tree. when it's burning. Yeah. So that county that you mentioned, I'm very familiar with it because early Bigfoot pioneer, Michigan <clears throat> pioneer, by the name of Wayne King, went up there and sp- actually spoke with that sheriff that you mentioned uh, over the same thing to investigate. And at that time, oh. he um, he noted, made a report of it, took a picture of it, a large 23-inch uh, footprint outside a new constructed home. And I, and I have to believe that that was the sheriff's home. The sheriff, incidentally was a retired state police trooper, as I remember it. So uh, that had been going, you know, these things have been sighted up in that area, mid-Michigan, for a long time, long time. Yeah, my aunt actually had, um, she only lived a few miles from my grandma, and she was in the, they had the DNR out there, they had the police out there, and was in the record eagle because they kept their chickens kept disappearing they couldn't figure out what was shaking the chickens so they got a huge dog and all of a sudden they hear the dog go off and then they hear this huge crash and they go out and they find these 18 inch footprints that went into the chicken house must have set the dog off because then it just blew through the wall of the chicken house going out the other side it didn't go in the door and that was in the mid 80s and uh, her poor daughters, they never lived that down in high school, you know, because mm-hmm. like I said, the DNR was there, Benzie County was there, it made the record Eagle. They still have, uh, I think two of the girls got tattoos of the prints they found on their shoulder. Really? Wow. Yeah. That's that was how much it impacted them. And they're, they're not the type that would normally get ink, especially back in that day, you know, but they each got, I think it was a set of three they found. So and they still got the cast from them. Uh, I just talked to my aunt recently, and she was going to try to find the cast for me so I can have that. You talk about indelible, leaving an indelible impression on somebody. Oh, you yeah. Take, you take an ink yourself up with, with a print like that. That's pretty extraordinary. Yeah, and they are very, uh, I could try to word this properly, a lot of hardcore Christian. Mm-hmm. So tattoos isn't something they particularly are fond of, mm-hmm. but that was just the impression left on them that this is how we're going to remember it. It did happen. Mm-hmm. So, so how did uh, you leave that conversation with the DNR officer? We are left they- it at, um, that I would go out there and clean everything up, that I would quit baiting the bears. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> quit feeding the bears. Uh, if she had any more issues, you know, she had my phone number now. If I had any questions, I was more than welcome to call her back. The interesting part of that conversation as well that I forgot to mention was, um, you know, they had collected peanut butter drops from out there. Basically, I think if I was a jerk, they were going to push this a lot further, you know, with the whole littering and kicking me off the property and everything mm-hmm. else. Mm-hmm. 
And she's like, well, technically they're your property. Do you want them back? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, well, what kind of condition are they in? And she's, well, there's a bunch of them. You can tell the squirrels and the raccoons and everything chewed on them. And she said, but there's, you know, there's quite a few that aren't. I said, okay. I said, are they full? And she's like, no, they're, they're empty. She says, but why did you put a date on the bottom and a different date on the top? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm just sitting there chuckling thinking I didn't, <laughs> you know, some, so something out there screwed different jars with mm-hmm. different tops with different dates and locations, but Mixing somehow it. got back together to form one unit. Mix it and wow. match it. So, so the, bear, wow. the bears figured out how to sit there and spin them, you know? The bears did this. Mm-hmm. So so we're talking about one or two empty jars, right? No, we're talking dozens. Oh. <laughs> I mean, literally for two and a half years, six jars a week. That's a lot of peanut butter, ladies and gentlemen. How oh, the lady at Walmart hated seeing me. <laughs> Especially during the peanut butter shortage. <laughs> that explains why I didn't have peanut butter jelly sandwiches down yeah, here. The- now the question is, Sean asked earlier, what type of peanut butter did you leave them? Uh, I'd leave them basically to Walmart because that was the cheapest brand. You know, if I forgot to bring so much stuff at the convenience store, the funniest part about it is they only ever took one jar of crunchy. If I left, I left multiple jars of crunchy out there. Wouldn't touch it. <laughs> Leave what? only uh, out of probably twelve different attempts, they took one <laughs> jar of crunchy. I thought maybe it was the color of the lid, mm-hmm. so I messed with them and put the red lid on the. You know, no, didn't work. So, did you remove the seal off the the peanut butter before? You laid it out there, Brian. For the first month, yes, and then I decided to see what would happen if I didn't, and then. They still kept disappearing, so I never touched another seal. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, and like I said, every you would find pieces of the seal. It was you could follow almost like a little pathway because they always unwrapped the jar, you know, took the paper off it, and then you would find the paper. You mean the label? The label, yep. Off the, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, yep. the bears. Yeah, I can see. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I've seen the bear on cocaine. I lived in Lexington, Kentucky. I've seen the movie. All right. Now, no way in hell a bear can do that. Here, I'll show I'm you something sorry. real quick. Let me grab something real quick. This yeah. is the first jar I ever found. I cannot believe this, ladies so, and gentlemen. Imagine a bear with four six inch claws uh, trying to unscrew a jar. There that it is. is a huge thing of peanut butter. There's my peanut butter and jelly sandwiches right yep, there. There it is, Val. That's it. And Get that's how it. clean it it, it 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 came back? Yeah, that's how I know it's them because if I find ones that the squirrels and the chipmunks and the raccoons get in, they're, they're sloppy and you can find their fingernails on the side and, mm-hmm. you know, that would happen. I got to the point where some spots you could see the raccoons come up to it and you would find half a jar of peanut butter. So I would change different spots so the raccoon wouldn't leave the, the peanut butter alone. But there's not a mark on this. I mean... Lids peeled off perfect. And this is how all the big ones will come back. Sometimes with the lid screwed right back on. This is the first one I found, so I kept it. I I, 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 I can't even underestimate by saying I have at least a hundred of these. So you're so there's no trace in that jar of peanut butter at all. Nope. Nothing. That is crazy. That's a task that requires dexterity, endurance. I put it in the dishwasher once to try to see if I could get it that clean. Nope. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this would happen within two or three days. Mm-hmm. So it's not like they had them forever. It's amazing. And uh, they would actually take, whoops. They would actually take, you know, I started putting other things out there too. I started like uh, beads. I put out a glow in the dark ball, you know, just one of those cheap glow in the dark balls. I put it on top of a, the barrel. And yeah, something like that. Except this one would glow at night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these are cat balls. Now, ladies yeah. and gentlemen, they uh, these are inexpensive cat balls. Uh, mm-hmm. These are real good to use. Uh, I know Val is probably thinking, "Shut the hell up, Grizz." <laughs> so yeah, we're trying to dissuade this, and here we are. <laughs> but I put that glow in the dark ball out, and then it disappeared, and I couldn't find it. Three months later. That ball was put back in the exact same spot. There's not a mark on it. And I'm like, what the heck? I'm like, why'd they give it back? 
And then it dawned on me. I went and I put it inside. I had a dark hoodie sweatshirt on. And so I went like this with the ball. It didn't glow anymore. So the glow had worn off. So my guess is they put it back because they wanted something different. And sure enough, it was right around Halloween. So you could buy those Halloween glow-in-the-dark maggots Mm -hmm. that a lot of fly fishermen will use. Mm -hmm. So I bought like a 100 of those and I screwed them into the peanut butter jar. And I put that back in the spot and went out the next day and it was gone. I haven't found that yet. Hmm. Now, I know for a fact, ladies and gentlemen, I don't mean to laugh, but people that use these cat balls that I just showed you, they disappear. They do. But they get mad when they quit shining and glowing in the dark. Mm-hmm. And they do return them. <coughs> so Chris wants to know, have you ever found any hairs? Uh, I have two jars that I've got packed up that uh, there's some hair in it. Some long red, reddish hair. And then also have a, I hate to say this, you know, luckily my girlfriend can't hear me, but a huge piece of poop in my freezer right now waiting to go out as well. Because uh, if it was a bear, he was about a thousand pounder that left this mark. Wow. So there's some now there. there you go, crazy witch. There's your DNA sample. I'll tell you what's going to happen to that DNA sample. It's going to happen like everything else. He's going to send it off and it's going to disappear. Mm-hmm. Poof, just like yes. that. Yeah, exactly. Poof goes to the poop. <laughs> yes, mm-hmm. Chris. I know, right? So I, know, what I recommend <laughs> is find a veterinarian in your area that does DNA tests that you can trust. And talk about stink. Even though it was frozen, I had it in the back of my truck. My truck smelled for three days after that. <laughs> wow. Like, man. I mean, it. I had to cut it in half to put it in a box to put it in my freezer. <laughs> it was... I don't mean to laugh, ladies and gentlemen, but I mean, I mean, Val uses a metaphor about going into the park bathroom. Mm -hmm. and using the facilities and unfortunately there are these bung holes that you have to flush the commodes right and that is nasty ladies and gentlemen now can you imagine now i i never mind i that yes i can imagine yes that's a lot of money spent missy on peanut butter well it's a good thing i don't drink or do drugs so that was my binge was the peanut butter i mean there are people, Val, that wander the woods for 30 years and don't even have an encounter, and Brian goes out and feeds them. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's this is wild. Mm-hmm. And, yes, and, Chris, that's some serious scat. Mm-hmm. And I know I'm, I'm laughing and joking at this point, but to, to really drive the point back home, if you're going to do what I did, really reconsider. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna, I need to tissue right now um the the consequences for not only the people but the suspects themselves you know literally can mean life and death Mm -hmm. and i did it just because of my own curiosity Mm -hmm. and now i put everything nature's balance is not in balance at this point because of me um and if just one person, if it saves one person's life, their pet, a squatch, as dumb as that sounds, you know, I don't want them to get hurt. That's been their home for decades, if not longer. And now I put that in danger. And, and, and what was my end game to prove it to who? You know, I was doing it for me and to share with a very close group of friends that have the same interests. Like, hey, cool, look what I found. You know, it's kind of like trading matchbox cars, but on a bigger mm-hmm. scale that I didn't understand. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot of people out here, Brian, and Chris and Sean, everybody's telling you, man, you did, don't beat yourself up, brother. You didn't know this was going to happen. It's not well, like that there was a book that says, you know, this is what's going to, this is going to be the recourse, you know. Well, literally from about two weeks into it, when Val and I started communicating, he's like, be careful, this could go south on you real quick, <laughs> you know, and uh, he was right. You know, I should have listened. I should have figured out a different way to do that. I should have never got lazy is, I think, was the big thing. You know, because where I was going was a mile and a half to two miles in. 
That's like going off and shark caging with the great, you know, cage diving with great whites, figuring out, okay, well, if I bait him, I can get him in a mile. Oh, guess what? I can hand feed him off the beach and not think now the sharks are out there bumping surfboards mm -hmm. and it's not mine. It's other people. So 8,000 reports from homeowners, property owners across North America, U S and Canada, 388 reports of house pounding over 2000 instances of law enforcement being drawn into the Bigfoot mystery, the bear mystery. Over 1,000 reports of window peeping and probably about 1,500 reports of gunfire. That's a lot. That's, That's a lot. only what's been reported. What's been re exactly right. Exactly. Well, here's the thing, too, is the property where this that I go on, um, local legend has it that the, the original owner of this hundreds of acres i don't want to give too much away because i don't want people going out there no, no. I, I, um, but, absolutely but, uh, but there were hundreds of acres out there and the reason why this company was able to purchase the land was because back in the late 1800s a family had bought it put a cabin up mm -hmm. and then within a very short period of time the squatches got so aggressive to this cabin that the people abandoned the property and never came back mm -hmm. It stayed within the family until uh, for decades. And then the family, you know, at that point, it's some, you know, the inheritance 50, 60 years down the road or however long it was, mm -hmm. sold it to this company to make a conservancy out of it. Mm -hmm. So if local legend has it right, there's been well over 100 years worth of activity out in this place, which is why I feel horrible because now hopefully it doesn't displace them because that's their mm -hmm. home. Mm -hmm. That's been a fascinating uh, um, encounter and experience. And I think that you've done a great service to a lot of people out there listening and uh, people that don't know that probably are getting into this for the first time. Um, and as you know, you guys know you you've seen my my work. Um, I'm not a proponent of that. I'm not a proponent of hurting those things. They they have a place in the world like I do. That's their place there. This is my place here. Here are my boundaries. This is my parameter. Don't cross this, and you're okay. But when you enable and encourage these these things to approach your property. That's where the problems lie. That's where the message has to go out and people have to be educated on that. Yeah, people don't understand the power these mm -hmm. things have. Mm -hmm. I mean, just raw natural strength and what might seem like a little kid slap to them could take out the average human being. And imagine you're going out there once or twice a week for a few hours and now these poor people have to deal 24-7 or at least 12 hours at night was when most of it was happening every night in their own home. So another neighbor close by on this property, close to this conservatory, uh, they had problems of motion detectors going on and off all hours of the night. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, they, uh, I didn't speak directly to them. It was through the neighbors. They act as one group out there. Like they had like a little spokesperson mm -hmm. and that was who talked to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if it was the lights were going off because of what was going in the yard. Mm -hmm. I imagine at first it was probably just a peanut butter spot through the yard. Mm -hmm. But, you know, eventually that was the same homeowner who had them peeking in their window. So that would do it for me. Yeah. And, that would and do it's it like, for me. you know, my friend who occasionally goes, well, aren't you mad? You should be mad that they're, you know, you can't do it. I said, no, I am not mad. I am absolutely devastated that I did this to these people. Mm hmm. You know, to anybody who is even thinking about this, think about those around you and think about what you're doing it for and consider what could happen to those swatches if things go bad. Mm -hmm. If you're out there to enjoy them and to learn about them, care for them by not doing it. Mm -hmm. Look, they've been around for a very, very, very long time, millennia, as some people say. 
they lived and they existed without McDonald hamburgers, French fries, peanut butter, candy. For all these years, what makes us think that by giving them uh, these these accoutrements would would make them any better, any happier? You know, you're messing up. We're messing up a a uh, a life. We're messing up their life process by doing this kind of stuff, by intervening, you know, in our man-made things. Uh, to me, it's not, it's, it's not cool. It's not cool Absolutely. at all. You're messing up their lives and you're messing up. If anybody lives close by, you're messing up their lives too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because now you've got an eight foot imaginary monkey peeping in your window mm -hmm. or worse. Your dog comes up missing. You know, your cat can't run fast enough that day. And I, and I say this over and over again, uh, you know, there's a lot of things I don't like. I don't like clown faces. I don't like people in costumes. It's just one of those creepy things that I've never uh, got used to. I do not like window peepers. You know, in law enforcement, window peepers, FBI knows this. Anybody that studies criminology knows this. A lot of the very heinous criminals rapists, murderers, what have you, serial killers, they start by what? By being a voyeur, a window peeper. Did you know that? No. Yeah, it that is, is a fact. True. That, is, that is true. That is true. That's how they start. It's, it's incremental uh, progress moving up and up. And that's the reason why uh, when, I look at, when I look at Bigfoot, uh, Bigfootology, I draw on the experience and the, the, the background from where I came. And I look at this a little differently. A lot of people would say, no, nah, you know, that's, that's not aggressive. That's just the way they are. No, nope. in, in, in society, which I live, I'm a part of society. You, you're all a part of society. We have norms. We have practices. We have ideas. What is good? What is, what is bad? We all have to have that or else we wouldn't have a society, a civil society. But think about think about the different aspects of Bigfootery and apply that to modern day terms. And I know a lot of people say, I disagree. You know, they're not they don't live in modern society. They don't socialize like we do. But why do you call them people? Why do you call them sob? Why do you call them forest people then? Um, there's a lot of things that there's a lot of different ways that you can look at this and draw lines and conclusions. But um, I know I know that that the the crap that they put in food nowadays is not good for us. It can't be good for them. They didn't live on this stuff a millennia, a millennia ago. They never had to worry about uh, uh chemicals and all that kind of stuff it was all natural it was all you know, natural. i'm even more concerned though because um if, if window peeping is the first step of bad behavior mm -hmm. what did i create out there then if they're already there well know, the good thing is you you, you know you you learn and you know and you go on from there brian you know well, we all a, we all just a, learn you know which was why I, I, I really was glad you asked me on to do this because I really want to dissuade people. From, if there's anybody nearby, I don't even know if there was nobody nearby, if you should really do it anymore. I, would, I wouldn't repeat it. Mm -hmm. You know, I would find another way without mm -hmm. encroaching on other people's lives. Uh, I have a friend in Cadillac, Michigan, by the way, that, that, that town keeps surfacing and stuff. And he is a uh, lifetime gifter, Bigfooter. And I mean, so accustomed, so used to their company that he gives them names. And he tells me, and, and I, I speak with him often, but he tells me that in the summertime, he has a garage and he plays the old VCR movies all night long. And they watch this. They're entertained by this. He tells me one time and he gives them candy bars and he tells me the names of the candy bars and stuff like that. 
Uh, in return, he says one morning he, he woke up, went outside, and found a pink pig on the fence post. Now, this is a pig that obviously came from somebody's farm. It was yeah. stolen, and it was a gift to him. But, you know, I like the guy and stuff, but I, I you know, I don't agree with that. I, I don't, I simply don't agree with that stuff. I don't. Yeah, well, my career came to an abrupt end there. I'll still go out. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully still have some kind of experiences without using the food. Here's a, here's another thing. You know, I don't I don't go out as much as I did because I, in my mind, I'm thinking about these other things. If I'm in the state areas and I know that there's a lot of state property, a lot of government owned property that's leased privately to to farmers to farm and i don't know if the if the food the, the the crop is is left for the animals the wildlife to support but i get this idea in my head that they spray this stuff with chemical you know the roundup uh, stuff that, that yeah. we get rid of you know that we supposed to be good for weeds and all that kind of stuff to me that's 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 the same thing as the Agent Orange that caused so much problems with, with American veterans. And I don't want to be walking through that stuff out there. I don't want to be walking through that stuff, come home with that stuff in my clothes and, and bring it around to my house and, and poison everybody else in my house and stuff. So those are the things that I look at. I'm looking at the ticks that I bring home with me. Came home uh, uh, a couple summers ago and had something crawling on my neck, and I and I reached over, pulled it off. It was a tick, and um, deer ticks. So deer ticks, the pesticides and stuff that are sprayed on as a, as a defoilant out there in the in the woods, these are all contributing factors for for me in my mind to be satisfied with what's out there. I know what's out there, evidenced by my own encounter, but these are the hazards that people have to think about when they go out there and, and do these kind of things. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, there's way more to consider than just what your goal is, but how you're going to reach your goal, how you're going to what you have to do to achieve that goal, the path you have to follow, the circumstances you have to work around, the obstacles. What's going to happen when you meet that goal? One of the one of the advantages from my vantage point of sitting down here and analyzing and reading hundreds of thousands of reports, uh, when we're speaking about gifting and baiting, uh, do you realize that some people still take <clears throat> used female hygiene products as a as a means of baiting sasquatch and bigfoot you know i actually have a member of the gym <laughs> that i work at who does that for deer when he that deer is hunts. correct ladies and gentlemen they do deer hunters he, put, he puts them on his boots. Use, that is correct and they will drag them along tampons and and yes that is correct and they would freeze them Mm -hmm. He's telling yeah, the that's truth. what he does. I, I was just like, what? And he's like, no, dude, I'm telling you, it covers your scent and everything, brings in big bucks in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that is and so my my question is ethical. It's an it, it brings up an ethical issue. Is it good? Is it right? Is it proper? Um I, I if I have a female uh in company with me and biologically we're different. Do do I wish to put her and place her in harm or place somebody else in harm by doing something like this? You know, I, I kind of I, myself, I, I know I'm a little different the way I look at things. My outlook in life is different than yours and everybody else. That's what makes us unique. However, um, those are some of the, the real life things that I look at. How is how is my action now? going to affect somebody down the road in the future. And those are some of the things that I wrestle with when I look at this stuff. Well, see, I look at things like Newton's cradle. Now, people <laughs> do not know what Newton's cradle is. 
Google that, ladies and gentlemen. It's no, those little know. balls that hangs on a string. You take one and you pull it and let it go. And the energy transfers through all those other balls. And that end ball Whoa. gets smacked and it bounces and it goes in the air and it comes back, transfers all the mm -hmm. And just Google if you don't know what Newton's cradle is. I'm a big proponent of that. So, yes. I've seen I've seen those quite often and they seem to be a stress reducer to sit and, and watch them tick tock rocking back and forth. But I never knew that that's what they called them. Yes. That is Newton's freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is correct. Yeah, I wish I, I wish I would have been a bit more foresighted than that because I tend to look at the immediate few seconds ahead as, as far as I look, you know, I'm a, I've been working in the gym since 1996. I've been lifting weights since I was 14. So my my goals are, I mean, to, to put it bluntly, my next workout, I need to go up one rep or one pound. And that's about as far as I look. Mm -hmm. So if I put one jar of peanut butter out, that's not going to hurt anything. Well, next thing I know, I'm two years into this, and now things have changed drastically from being so short-sighted. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely taught me to look further ahead make sure because in normal life i do consider well if i say this how's that person going to feel or mm -hmm. which is why i'm very careful with if you tell this person this you better make sure you're willing to tell that same person that to their face mm -hmm. you know and that i heard you said this and then i'll go yeah that's what i said and i'll say it again but you, As, need, you, you need you need to be honest with yourself. Is this going to be something I can control? And if you think yes, you need to think again. Is this really something I can control? Because these are forces beyond comprehension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a chess, as a chess player, looking at strategy, looking at moves, trying to look at moves before I move, and anticipating what the what the result can can be. Um, that's the way, that's the way I've always been. That's the way I look at things. Um, looking for the action, the reaction and looking down the, the road to see how I could navigate around, you know, the different things and stuff. But, um, uh, you know, I, I felt that this, your encounter, your experience, Brian was, would be very, very, very good for, for people to hear for a lot of different reasons, a lot of different ways. And um, and I appreciate you both having me on to mm -hmm. hopefully change somebody's mind about doing this. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely, yeah. You know, it's because if you would have talked to me before, the, you know, two months ago, I'd be, ah, look, I'm doing it, it's just fine, mm -hmm. you know. And it's amazing how quick that mindset can change when all of a sudden the worst scenario does happen. You know, I just posted a thread about uh, Bigfoot's animate and inanimate objects. And your peanut butter jar and the tree that you that you say, and, and strike me if I'm incorrect, you found one jar eight foot up in a tree. Is that right, yeah. Brian? Yep. So... Would you say that a cougar put it up there? I mean, do cougars do that? Uh, maybe if he was toothless, because there wasn't a mark on the jar. <laughs> toothless, I love just, that. Just there curious. Wasn't a scratch. There was just a curious. Top just was curious. on it, so he was he was pretty skilled. <laughs> so so we're looking at we're looking at a being, largely. Uh, uh, using fingers and digits like we have it takes some effort to 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 place it up in a tree chances are the being is is taller than eight foot which which is no effort at all you just pick it up and place it up there why is that so hard for people to comprehend and grasp you know that um whether it's whether it's a tire a jar, a, a, a bale of straw, a tent, a bike, even even people. 
Why is it so hard for people to comprehend that cougars don't always do this? Yeah, I, I don't understand. Yeah, it, I don't. Maybe it's a display of look how big I am. You can't reach it, and look what I put up here. Well, just in the same manner that you received that business card, that mm -hmm. business card that was probably this dimension, this size, the same manner that I interpret Bigfoot to communicate to us. And I've got a plaque upstairs with with some some things, some badges and stuff like that, what have you. Um, that's me. That's That's my history. That's my legacy. Right or wrong, good or bad, that's me. That's all I got to show for my for my life on this earth. What I see in those trees communicates, this is me. This is my work. This is my handiwork. You want some of me? Come and get me. Stay here. I'll be here at a certain time. <laughs> you yeah. stay here. You come back here. You come back here and and you want some of me, you know, I'll show you. This is my handiwork. Again, going back to what I said earlier about the window peeping and that kind of business, yes, that's what you find when you delve into the criminal minds too. The same thing, the narcissistic uh, uh, elements in their personality, their character, um, it, braggadocio, you know, hey, this is me, this is what I do. Look at the tree structures, the same thing. Beautiful, exquisite, geometric tree structures that can't possibly form by wind and rain or ice or anything else you can't explain. Some people will try, but uh, for those of us that know, those of us that are aware, we know. We know what, what causes a lot of that stuff, and it's not, it's not man-made. Cougars don't do it. Uh, bears don't do it. We know. We know. Yeah, and that was where I should have left it, you know, because I would go out and find that stuff. I got some beautiful pictures of some beautiful intricate interwoven branches that look almost like a Christmas tree star or something, but, you know, with logs that are two or three inches in diameter. I, I, I don't see long. I, you know, I would never carry myself or even present myself as an expert. I don't know everything, but what I do know is we can't explain a lot of stuff involved in Bigfoot. Grizz, you mentioned that you mentioned that Bigfoot um, video of um, transparency. Yes, absolutely. Uh, something, something out of a uh, Hollywood Predator movie. movie. Yes, yes, Hollywood it actually cloaked. And we have witnesses in this chat room that actually watched that show. Mm -hmm. Arnold uh, Schwarzenegger, I think, the Predator movie. Yes. Um, so and... I just po I just posted a, a picture shortly, a, a, a short time ago, of something uh, near a tree structure. And I don't know about anybody else, but I see a... Um, I see a... Um, I see part of the tree in this in this figure, this image. I can see through it like it's translucent. Um, I can't explain it. Um, you know, perhaps this is the reason why uh, nobody of authority will admit to to their existence because they can't control it. You know, this is beyond their their ability to control. It. Um, now, our military has the technology. Mm -hmm. We've seen it on future yes, weapons. Yes, yes, I've seen it too. In fact, I think they used it in the last Middle East war. So and it's incredible. Yeah, well, I mean, it's very technique. interesting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Chris, I mean, because Brian, we actually have reports where you'd be out in the middle of the woods and you probably experience this where an elephant sounds like it's running, running towards you. But you cannot see anything, but you're, and you feel the wind go by you, and you don't see nothing. But you hear all the branches and everything else breaking around you. Right. Yep. I've, I've never had one that close, but I have where you swear you're going to look and see something bulldozing through the woods. Right. And you, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, now, this something. woman caught this on an iPod 4. She had it taped to her walking stick. Mm-hmm. And right before it happened, and she had Hollywood and everybody. She's very well known. And right before it happened, it was a, like a quick flash of light. Like mm-hmm. something ran in front of the sun. And the vegetation moved. And she's like, what was that? Did you see that? And uh, and I, I played it like back and forth, back and forth. I mean, I mean, it was uh, it was amazing. I mean, I, I mean, it literally freaked me out because we hear about that they are capable of doing this. Mm-hmm. People trying to debunk it. People used her iPod. They're like back then at 2014, 2015, whatever. The technology on that device, there was no way that you know they could duplicate it. They mm-hmm. said it was aliens being abducted by something or whatever. I mean, they, they all kinds of stuff, you know. I mean, it was it was crazy. But they slowed it down, and uh, you have to watch the whole footage. And it was, uh, she said she saw a set of hands. And the other friend said, well, I saw something else. So when they when they did the still shots, uh, they went back the next day and they found the tracks. It looked like during the video, it was grabbing the brush and either moving it or pulling it out of the way. And they caught the hands or something in the video. Sounds like a portal or something. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, didn't MK Davis just do a special in the last two years on the PG film where he, slowed it down there was a flash of light and then within a few frames you could see another face or sasquatch or shadow next to that flash was everybody and and everybody's saying you know a flash of light Mm -hmm. a flash of light Mm -hmm. and you know is that a portal opening up i don't know i'm not an expert Mm -hmm. but you know we're taking people's encounters and we're trying to you know, put the pieces of the puzzle together. I mean, there's got to be something to it. So, you know, I mean, how can something, and she said, you know, during one encounter, because she was a big, you know, proponent of gifting. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said she saw it walking down the hill. And she said, you know, just like a deer hunter, it walked behind this tree. And right after that, she's like, I knew I was going to see it come out, but it never came out. It just disappeared. Hmm. She's like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Now, being a former hunter, I don't know how many times I've seen a deer walk, and I'm like, ooh, as soon as it comes right out in that clearing, I'm going to drop it. And I wait, and I would drop it. Mm-hmm. Now, with that being said, these things, whatever you want to call it, are so intelligent, she would hide digital recorders on her property, picnic tables, and when they weren't looking, they would come up and turn them off. Now, mm-hmm. how in the world would they that, know how to turn off a digital recorder? Mm-hmm. That happened to me twice. You see what well, I'm saying? About, listen to this. Mm-hmm. When I put out a recorder, the, it'll normally go nine, ten hours. And out of the six times I put one out twice, they both stopped around the 23-minute mark. They got shut off. I'm sitting, here, exact order. I'm sitting here taking this all in and it's like trying to make sense of it shut off 23 minutes after I leave it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, no, they physically the vow, turn these things up. We're not talking mm-hmm. batteries being drained. Mm-hmm. We're talking physically turn power off. And they know Stop. for a f- they know for a fact that something didn't come up behind the, the camera and, and shut it off. Well, mine was just a digital recorder, so yeah, just a digital recorder. And, and when I turned it, when I turned it back on, it showed twenty three minutes of recording, and it showed the battery life was full. Yes, that so is I'm correct. Like, what the heck? Yeah, stuff like that, you know, um, I I couldn't explain. I couldn't even. Uh, well, she be, can't explain it. I can't explain begin, it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's incredible. Now, how in the world? You're trying to tell me something like Captain Caveman walk around in the middle of the woods that can open up a peanut butter jar, 
peel back the the the, the tin foil lid, mm-hmm. screw it back on, knows how to turn on and off a digital recorder. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I always tell people it is like a meth head. You stop giving a meth person meth and see what happens. That's why they steal. Because mm-hmm. they got to have that fix. And that's what Bigfoot does when you quit feeding it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it so, doesn't take long. And it doesn't. But, you know, trail cameras, they will, they will move them up a tree. They will turn them. They will wave sticks in front of it. They will drain the batteries. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how they do this. Mm -hmm. Now, Val, I do have theories. Brian, I do have theories. I've got 29 trail cameras, almost 30. Mm. I'm going to put them on a camera, 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 on a camera. Watching each other. Yes. So... My friend Lance and I went out and we put a trail cam up just for the length of time we were there. And Lance said he caught something in the in one photo because then we came back and got the trail cam and took it. But after that trail cam went off, that area died for two weeks. Yes. They did not do anything in that area for two weeks. Like Mm -hmm. they knew it went off. They knew what it was. And they're like, "Okay, if you're going to do this, we're not going to play no more. That is correct. I've heard that they can see infrared, so I've got the new ones that are not infrared. They can reach up to 90 feet, so yes. And I have one girl that put them 12 to 14 feet up in the air, and they get shoved higher up in the tree. Now, Mm -hmm. squirrels do not move trail cams higher in a tree. Now, I can see squirrels pushing a trail cam down by maybe sitting on it, but not up a tree or turn 90 degrees or 45 degrees or ripped off a tree. So, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things I cannot explain. So the other day, Val, I was in the park and I was playing disc golf. That's a crazy sport, ladies and gentlemen. And I didn't know that numbers on disc meant a certain things. Yes, Sean. Uh, I do have one of those little photo or telescopic ladders. Yes. Doesn't matter. So, and I didn't know numbers on the disc means if you throw one straight, it gets going to go turn left or turn right or whatever. I found out the hard way. So I threw one straight and it went way down. I thought I was going to go in the lake. This park is out in the middle of the woods. So I went down there to get my disc and I'm walking up the hill and I'm like, Nah, there's no way I just seen that. I was like, there's no way that that's a that that's a that's a track. That's a footprint. Another six, seven feet. There's another one. It's a little bit better. So the person that I was with, I was pulling out my cell phone. I was like, yeah, I got I'm, I got to take a picture. What are you doing? I was like, I'm texting somebody about a show. I didn't want her to freak out because so I'm like, this she ain't coming back, and if she knows what I'm doing, so. Just out of my curiosity, Fedoria, is that what it's called when your mind can make things up and see things? Mm-hmm. All right. So just cool. out of curiosity, I sent that photograph out to a couple of people. I'm like, what do you see? They're like, holy cow, you got a juvenile. And I'm like, what? I got a juvenile with an adult in a park next to a reformatory next to a next to a big lake Mm -hmm. i didn't i didn't catch the juvenile i caught the big one Mm -hmm. so isn't that amazing pareidolia uh, affects different people different ways because we all are uniquely different but uh, you know this this idea of cloaking and stuff like that predator this stuff has me uh <laughs> i don't know what to think about it <laughs> i'm speechless i don't know what to think about it hey. yes yes i know there's technology out there that's uh used in the military industry for stuff like that but you know like ron moorhead told me he's one of my admins okay ron moorhead came out in his book quantum Bigfoot, didn't he? Or 
with the, mm-hmm. uh, earlier this year. Mm-hmm. And he told me, he said, Chris, 40 or 50 years ago, you would have talked about interdimensions, whatnot. He would laugh and wouldn't even entertain the subject at all. He said, but now, he said, not only do we have to look outside the box, now we have to look over the box. Mm -hmm. There is a lot more to this, whatever you want to call it, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, footering, whatever. There is more intelligence than what we know. Now, Chris and I had a long discussion the other night that's in the chat room. And I voiced my opinion, which I will not voice on live air. And if this thing can do things that it allegedly can do, what is it here on Earth? What is its purpose? Now, explain that, Val. I've got my own ideas. Um, Brian, what, what do you think? Brian's speechless. Well, yeah, because to me, I used to discount that stuff, but I mean, until we got one that can come out and is willing to tell us what it can and can't do, I think everything is on the table. Maybe it they're is. aliens, maybe they're interdimensional, maybe they can do mind speak, maybe nothing should be discredited or because you can't prove or disprove it at this point. You need to have a really open mind as to what the possibilities are. You know, Brian, I told people years ago, I never forget, when Jurassic Park first came out, I said, that's the future. It's going to happen. Terminator, when that came out, I said, that's the future. It's going to happen. AI, everybody laughed at me. Guess what? Came reality. So, with that that being said, go ahead, Brian. I put a post up the other day in a group, you know, more of a sci-fi type group. I thought everything that this like Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica and Terminator, all this stuff is coming true. Who's to say maybe at some point time travel is out of the realm and maybe they came back and put these ideas in these people's heads. And that's why we're still calling it hyperspace. That's why we're still calling it artificial intelligence. Because everything antimatter, dark matter. The I mean, God where did they get particles. the idea? And how did it? Yeah, the God particle. Where did they get the ideas? And why? How? How have they keep proving these same topics and kept the same name? Well, poor Val's over here trying to wrap his mind around everything. I know Val. I'm there, been there. And when I got into the social media platforms and I told people, you cannot tell me that I have to believe in your ways of thinking to join your group. That is a Gestapo. Mm-hmm. You know, how can I tell Brian that there's no way This creature, whatever you want to call it, knows how to go up to a digital recorder and turn it off. Now, I would laugh at him. I'm Mm -hmm. like, there's no way in hell. They're they're not that intelligent. But I've heard this story over and over and over. And these are credible people. We're not talking batteries drain, Mm -hmm. you know. And then we're now we're getting videos of things that we cannot explain, Mm -hmm. flashes of light on video. And I Mm -hmm. mean, what is it? Well, you know, in in Hollywood, they called this predictive programming. And that is that is preconditioning people uh, by by the use of video and vision, such as Hollywood. And they use this to to introduce the public to things we we thought Star Trek and all these other movies, and I like Star Trek, but all these movies and and Predator, that's a creepy one. All these things that we thought were bizarre and oh my gosh, I'm glad that that isn't true. Really? All our life we've been programmed 
and from the beginning to the end. And Hollywood big producers use productive, uh, predictive uh, programming, you know, to usher us along, to get us into that mindset to prepare for what is real. When we all figure out what is real and what is, what is false and deceptive and all this kind of stuff. So um, zebras know that the, the pleasurable side of, of uh, zebra is knowing that uh, you can't paint the stripes on one. They're always there. They're born like that. They die like that. And as far as Bigfoots go and stuff like that, some of the best masterminds, the geniuses and of, of puzzles and science and everything, try to figure out, ask themselves this question over and over again. They can't even figure it out. Um, I suppose that we will learn more as we're supposed to. You know, as time goes on, uh, we're gonna we're gonna figure it out, and one day it's gonna hit us in the head like, like like a like a bottle against the head. We're gonna say, "Aha! Uh -huh, that's it. That's that's what I thought." So as time goes on, as we evolve, as the separation becomes greater and greater from one dimension to another, our eyes open up. We see more. We we're we're more perceptive. To, to things that we didn't feel were, were, were always there. The same thing happens to people. Why is it that some people can see things that other people can't? Why is it that some people can feel things intuitive, intuitively that other people can't? I think that uh, I, for one, think that, that people have an innate uh, ability to, to know a lot more than what we really uh, show ourselves or pretend to know. And we don't know it. We're human beings are very, very smart, intelligent creatures. That's what makes us special on this earth. And uh, we have just been blinded uh, by whoever, whatever, uh, to keep us in our shell because they can control us better when we're stupid and dumb. But I think as, as time moves on, um, things become a little thinner between between this this place and that place. And, and when we become wiser, our eyes open up and we see things that we normally haven't seen or realized or understood. That's what I think. So, uh, well, I'm when, glad you brought that up because we'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, edition is brought to you by Western Bigfoot and Paranormal Investigators LLC. Thank you, Don. Greatly appreciate it. But I agree with Val. Yes, I mean there's things that we cannot uh, believe and understand. Chris is saying, desensitize, crazy witch. I love seeing people uh, wake up to that. Awesome. Chris, Val is spot on, crazy witch. I wouldn't be in that uh, wheelhouse. Yeah, that wheelhouse does not stop spinning. 
Uh, Missy, Bigfoot, Yetis, Cryptids, all very elusive. Uh, definitely not the dumb ones. Crazy Witch, 100%. Sean, the light bulb is now going off. I don't understand. But it's amazing because we have people like Brian. We have people like Val that keeps up with databases. I mean, everybody's not telling us a lie. Do we have little Johnny running around in the ape suit late at night causing havoc in hell? Absolutely. We have our hoaxes and fakes. I always say that. But these things are intelligent. Now, years ago, I would say they were <laughs> not now. There's no way. Unscrew a peanut butter jar? I mean, the things they were capable of doing with tree... Hey, have you ever tried to do a, a, a bend on a tree, Val? No, no. I, I have, and I smack yeah. myself between the legs. And usually I break the tree. Ain't that right, Brian? Have you tried it? No, I've seen the dimensions, and I can't even bend it. So. <laughs> right, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I can't yeah. even twist a tree. No, that's the funny part, because like I said, you know, I'm not small. I'm 270 pounds with a 34 waist, bench 315, six reps. And to try to even hand twist some of the stuff I've seen out there just doesn't work. Look at some of these trees and imagine the torque, the that's pounds what, per square inch that's necessary to twist that thing. And that's what I allude to when I say the power of these things, just mm -hmm. raw, brutal strength. Mm -hmm. is, and incredible. the fact that they can control that to unscrew something as delicate as a peanut butter jar without exploding it on their fingers. Now, if you know, if you see one of these trees, like I have, that are that are twisted like a uh, like a like a wet dish rag, twisted. Yeah. Now, would you walk up to that thing and <clears throat> and try to rub its back? Yeah, Brian, this is where we call Val. Hold my beer moment. I'm gonna go pet this damn thing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and Not people, me. people, people want to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the whole thing. You know, see how close I can get, and then. You know, then there's the times where they obviously I got a little too close and he escorted me out of the woods. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I don't know. Exceptionally insightful, guys. Um, I don't know. I, I, the, I told I tell people there's there's something else going on that we do not comprehend. Does the government know they're out there? Absolutely. Does the DNR know about them? Absolutely. Does the police know about them? Absolutely. Yes. Well, and I can tell you that, you know, a guy who will not go on record because he is retired from the DNR. You know, he worked on Drummond Island for 25 years, which is a place up here in northern Michigan. And I came right out and asked him, you know, once he heard I was into the Bigfoot thing. You know, did you see any out there? And he's like, on the record, no. It's okay. How about off the record? And he says, yep, I saw two in 25 years. We had multiple reports of tracks. And he said, we actually saw one in late fall swimming toward the island. He says, but, you know, I can't tell people that because I'll lose my retirement and everything That's else. That's right. They what, is the, what lake is this? It'd be Lake Michigan. That's a That's a vast, vast lake, isn't it? And cold. And cold. And so from one land mass to another, <clears throat> how far would you say the distance is? You know, I don't know the exact distance, but they had to take a ferry to it because they would live on the island. It was far enough they were, there weren't daily ferries. And Lake Michigan, Lake Michigan, as we all know, is pretty shallow, isn't it? Uh, it goes to a thousand feet, don't it? That's pretty deep, bro. Yeah, that's pretty that's deep. Pretty that's pretty deep. So shallow. No, no, I, I, being sarcastic. Oh, but yeah, yeah that's a deep, deep uh, body of water. It's cold, and if it takes an hour or two hours by ferry from mainland to the island, that's a distance. That is a distance, my friend. Yeah, let alone trying to do it in a fur coat. Imagine the lung capacity that it takes to um, to make that distance. Now, keep in mind that commercial fishermen in Alaska have reported 
uh, Bigfoot sightings in the ocean. That's very cold. That is very cold. And commercial fishermen as far south as the Gulf of Mexico have also reported Bigfoot swimming in, in the ocean. Whether, whether uh, you know, recreating or by necessity or need, they have seen them. They reported it. These aren't stories made up. Uh, you know, I, I believe there are no such things as, as coincidences. When these, when these things pop up over and over, go, uh, over, and over again in successive order, uh, one should sit back, sit up, and take notice of these things. They're telling you something. They are telling you something. I agree. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there has been, what was it, a dolphin or a shark or something that just made the news recently that had a baby and they cannot figure out how in the world it reproduced when they had nothing in the same tank. Life finds a way. Mm -hmm. Just like Jurassic Park. It does. Somebody out there, fact check or fact check that. The first thing Still I would think about, the first thing I would think about is, is, is did the did the conception occur before people took notice to this particular dolphin? Um, that they they cannot they cannot explain it. They they say there is no way. Uh, between the gestation period and the mm -hmm. way, you know, they they have no idea. It is they. It's it's amazing. It made it made the national news. So, hmm. yes. So uh, I don't know what how things evolve. I know things that Chernobyl survived the nuclear war. Mm -hmm. I know there's microorganisms now that are that uh microbes that are now digesting plastic that evolve so things find a way life does find a way how and why i have no idea speaking of chernobyl for the life of me i don't understand how life is wildlife some wildlife is flourishing and yet uh that same area is is extremely fatal, extremely harmful to mankind. How is that explained? I have no idea. And hmm. see, and these are the rabbit holes, ladies and gentlemen, that we can continue to go down. Mm -hmm. So uh, Missy says, Juju, uh, dolphins can hold and receive sperm for years, I've been told by somebody. Well, that will explain it. If that is true, then that can explain it then. All right, mystery solved. Fact checker solved it. Okay. Yeah. Well, all I can say is it's a good thing that human beings aren't like that. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Think about our welfare system if that was the case. Man. Hmm. I know. Well, I'm, I better leave that one alone because we'll I, I get on right that alone. stuff. Yeah. We'll yeah. leave it right alone. Yes, sir. Look at Brian. Brian's like, no comment. I plead the fifth, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. That, that's but no, not a but, window you know, of opportunity. That's a garage yeah. door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there you go. But, you know, I, mean, you know, I mean, really, ladies and gentlemen, I mean, you think about life in general. You know, if people do not, Chris is laughing. Don't say it, Missy says. Don't say it. I know it. I'm not touching that line, Sean says. But, you know, the thing, though, is, is that they are saying now that there is a possibility, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a human a small hominoid that may be alive in what part of the world, I can't remember, that lives in a jungle. Yes, that's undiscovered. So, now that is amazing. Now, we are discovering, you know hundreds of species a day insects animals that are supposed to be non-existent extinct whatnot okay but how does sasquatch bigfoot footery fit in with the human 
evolution. That's what I don't understand. Mm -hmm. So, Miss Obama, uh, well, I have to check before I just take one person's word on the dolphin. Well, that's why I said I rely on my uh, fact checkers out there because I, I can't Google and, and click and talk at the same time and answer everybody's questions, but I try. Mm -hmm. But yes. So, I mean, explain that, guys. Were they left out? Homo sapiens don't play well with others, right? I mean, we kind of figured that out because, you know, ask a Neanderthal. Oh, wait, we wiped them out when we figured out tools. You know, as Bigfoot figured out that we don't play well, so maybe that's why they're trying to stay hidden. I'm just throwing stuff out there. I, I have no clue, to be honest. Oh, well, I, I have no clue. It's like maybe they try to stay hidden for a reason. I realize what when what happened when we came to North America and what happened to the people who are already here. They got pushed into, you know, various parts of the land that Eastern Europeans didn't want. And, you know, it's just, and the Sasquatch have been here since then, so they see we don't do well with others. So I wouldn't be too eager to interact with me either, seeing the history. Well, the only thing I know is, and I brought this up during conversation the other night with somebody I will not name is why is it every couple of thousand years that civilization is wiped out? Why is why is that? So, have we ever thought about that? You know, I, I, I'm watching the, uh, the board here. I'm looking at the questions, the comments, and yeah. one of the things that, that I found uh, fascinating with one of them was um, and pardon me I don't remember exactly who who put it up there but we're all aliens it said I kind of I kind of chuckle at that I remember my wife telling me my wife graduated from Wayne State University I graduated from Central Michigan University one of the things that in philosophy that she related to me that was told to her by a professor there was the same thing. We're all aliens. We're all star people. And and you think about that. Think about that that comment for a moment. Think about what you're saying. Think about the questions you're asking. And think about this. His the professor's uh, thought on this was this. We look up at the sky. We see falling stars. Uh, obviously from from unknown parts of the celestial galaxy they fall to earth this happens many 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 times over a lifetime we grow crops in the ground we eat the crops we expel the waste we plant crops again we feed the animals that eat uh, crops from the ground, the same ground, the same soil. This happens over and over again. Thus, we are part and parcel of uh, fabric <clears throat> from up there. So getting back to the alien issue, yeah, to some, to some respect we are. We are what we eat. You've heard that before. Yeah. And um, so... Uh, I've been told several times now since my involvement in Bigfootery 12 years that Bigfoots originated from another part of the galaxy. They came here because their, their planet, their world was ruined by war, and conflict. So this goes back and this speaks to an earlier question here tonight about Bigfoots and, you know, who knows what about what. <clears throat> My only thought on that is, <clears throat> are they here to replace us? I mean, they wear clothes. 
They, uh, they emulate people, uh, people in love, honey, uh, lovers holding hands, uh, watching the sun rise, watching the sun fall, uh, walking along the beaches. These are the same, these are the same uh, types of reports that I see many, many times over again. I've got reports of <clears throat> Bigfoot's singing as though singing to a loved one or to a group. People do that too. These reports of, of uh, Sasquatch's um, um, donning clothes and stuff, whether it's hides, crudely, crudely uh, constructed hides, or even um, um, shirts or pants or, or anything like that, even hats and belts, um, it kind of makes you wonder. It kind of makes you think about this a little closer. Now, there's somebody, the name is... Uh, Carrie Cassidy, she's the one that that, that uh, podcasted a show. It's been a while now, but she podcasted a show, and she asserts this guest, who is supposedly an anthropologist and a U.S. Army major who uh, studies animals and, and was specifically involved in speech, communication with animals. He had been tasked to work with Sasquatches up in the Pacific Northwest. He uh, became so involved in his work that he absconded with a, with a Sasquatch and they found a place in a foreign country where he is now. He wants to come home. He wants to come back to his native United States. So he shared with Carrie a lot of things about Bigfoot, such as their life expense expectancy, um, how they communicate from one point to other uh, Bigfoot in another place. In other words, forget about time, distant time and space. They're able to communicate to themselves, among themselves, as though they were talking like you and I are via the uh, microphones, telephones, computers, et cetera, et cetera. They communicate back and forth. And um, it's, it's her program that offered the idea that these things <clears throat> came here from another planet. I can tell you right now, that I don't, I don't uh, entertain any UFO discussion on my group site. Even though I know for a fact that there's a couple dozen reports in there um, that mention UFOs in successive order. Oh, we've seen orbs, we've seen, we've seen uh, unusual craft in the sky, and then uh, we, hear, we hear vocals, and then we see some large Sasquatch coming out of the tree line. That's the way these reports usually uh, report, you know, their findings and stuff. So there's other reports of, of people, witnesses that claim that they have seen Sasquatch-like beings on board those ships, those low hovering ships. When I hear uh, that person, Cassidy, talking about this stuff, yeah, it makes me think about this stuff. Make me come out about it. Uh, is it correct? I don't know. It's up to it's up to every individual to do their own diligence and consider everything, not just take a parcel here and say, "Yeah, I believe this," but read and gather as much as you can on the topic and make up your own decision. So if they're here, and there's another <clears throat> here's another thing that was mentioned. Riz, and I hope, I hope you can find somebody that can speak to this. This is the Miller document. There's a lot of uh, skeptics out there, and there's a lot of people out there that will, will uh, scream, yell, and, and kick over this being a fake, hoax, whatever, whatever. But anybody involved in Bigfootery knows that uh, 
you seem to get the most attraction when you're dead center over the target. It, it touches a nerve with a lot of people. A lot of people come out. A lot of people roar in anger when you mention this. But if you mention the Miller document, in that Miller document, and I've read the document a few times now, it's read like a uh, scientist, like a person very, very knowledgeable on, on the topic, very intelligent. And uh, he claims that um, a lot of the things that we already know, they're very territorial, they're very loyal to their to their kind, their family members, their kids, their young ones, but uh, they they need and use an enormous amount of resources. What am I talking about? I'm talking about they need water, they need veg uh, vegetation, they need food, they need uh, flesh, they eat flesh. They use up a lot of deer, moose, bear, everything. So when the when the resources get low, where do they go? Well, I guess they go around houses and farms and places like that where people are. There's always food and resources around them. One of the last things, one of the last paragraphs that stood out in this in this long uh, diatribe was that, and this is his feelings, this is his opinion, that humans and Bigfoots can never coexist. Do you hear me? They can never coexist. Why? I suppose because when the resources run low, uh, who do you think they're going to look for next? Who are they looking at next? If your animals are gone and you're the only one there, who are they going to look at? Well, they That's don't. I, way I, get. I, I told her, I told somebody the other night. All right. Some people live out in the country and they're missing some pets right now. And Orson Scott said it well. In the moment when I truly understand my enemy, understand him well enough to defeat him, then in that very moment, I also love him. I think it's impossible to really understand somebody, what they want, what they believe, and not love them the way they love themselves. And then, in that very moment I love them, I will destroy them. Mm -hmm. I will let that resonate. I'm, I'm a firm believer about keeping your enemies close. But I'll leave, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that subject alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, we do not know anybody's intentions. Mm -hmm. We don't, you know, now any grown adult, crazy witch, Chris, Missy, Johnny half, you know, Miss Bama, Sean, whoever, I'm not going to hold your beer. You're going to go out in the middle of a field and pet a lion. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. You're going to tell me you're crazy. I'm crazy. But people, unfortunately, do things with Bigfoot, Sasquatch, whatever you want to call it. And they don't want to understand the repercussions. So I do not know their intentions. Yeah, people gift. People do things. It's fine and dandy. Do I believe in it? No, I do not. I'm not a proponent of it as well. I think things change. I've I've always hear the horror stories now, just like customer service. You hear more negative than you do positive. Absolutely. Okay. It's that old saying, when I do something wrong, no one forgets. When I'm going to do something right, no one remembers. So, yes, I understand that concept. But with that being said, I am not going to take a chance. That's why I do not own a big dog. 
That's why homeowners insurance has restrictions on what type of animals that you do own. Because they can and will turn on you. I'm not saying all of them will. Yes, I know it's how you can raise them and graze them. But there is a still that chance, a possibility that they can turn. So, crazy witch, it's a joke. I mean, like a house pet. Secondly, associating an outside that's not exactly a pet. I agree. Miss Bama, not me. I'm not petting anything. You're damn right. I agree. Johnny Half, disagree with respect. You're right there. You, you don't, you, you have to know the Squatch clan and they have to know you. Well, that statement I just read. And what's that book that people never read? The Art of War? Mm -hmm. Zun Tzu. Zun Tzu. That's another mm -hmm. good one. Yes. There we go. I'm just saying, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, you know what? I do not hang out with these things. I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know. They have evidently, they outlive us. So I don't know. Uh, Chris, like a story of Randy, things can turn bad. Yes, that is a good uh, uh, Johnny Half. You need to go back and watch that episode of, of Randy and when he used to play with him. Mm -hmm. That is a horrible story. But once again, I hear people that they deal with it, they do whatever for years. So I don't know. Thomas, people have no clue what they're dealing with when it comes to these things. I agree, but hey, each their own, you know, people live with them from generations. And I've heard from generations. Grandpa tells grandson, you hunt here, don't go there. That's their land. We hunt here. We stay on this side of the property. Mm -hmm. That's the agreement. Now, what the hell does that mean? I mean, do you all go out there and have a conversation and say, this is our boundaries? You stay here, we stay there? I mean, I don't know. Nobody's never explained that to me. But they all, I always hear that. That's mm -hmm. the agreement. So I don't know. Brian, do they talk to you when you go out there? I mean, I always hear mine speak. So. No. I wouldn't go that far. I would say more what I experienced was gut instinct because there was nights I was going to go out with every intention. And then I would get right to the perimeter of that forest. And as I'm driving in, something in my head's going, tonight's not the night. Don't get out of the truck. Don't get out of the truck. Turn around and go home. Yeah. That would be the close, you know, but as far as, hey, leave this over here for me. Eh, no. Do I, and like I said, nothing's off the table, but I just never experienced it. Johnny Half, I agree with you. Thank you very much. I, I, I greatly appreciate the comment. I try my best, you know. Uh, hey, yes, I always keep my distance, you know, even on the, on the PD. You think I'm going to walk up to somebody, man? Hey, ask Val about the 21-foot rule, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I've seen videos with people with knives. I, I you know, I, we've done the test trying to pull out your firearm before you get stabbed and slashed mm -hmm. somebody with the knife. You've seen the videos on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Officers get stabbed four or five times before they get to draw the gun out of their holster. Miss Bama, I had mine speak, but I still don't trust them. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to say, Miss Bama. I, I, I really don't. I mean, everybody's got to form their own opinion. Everybody's got their own experiences. There's, there's a uh, there's a Northern Cheyenne uh, elder, a chief, by the name of Otis Frank. I think he's deceased now. If I'm not, I apologize. One of the things that he said, reference to timber crosses, territorial boundaries, and and so forth, was this. He says the children must learn when hunting in mountains, and, and, and I'm looking at this as it could apply anywhere. The children must learn when they're hunting in mountains to be careful not to step on their land. Here we go using those pronouns again. Their land. Didn't say Sasquatch Bigfoot. Their land. They mark it well, timber cross and sticks directional fi uh, finders that tell the wrong path our children 
must learn these signs. We were talking earlier about uh, stick formations and exquisitely and intricately uh, placed sticks. Uh, so this Indian chief, this Northern Cheyenne chief is, is telling his, his people, his kids, you must learn this. You must share this with your kids. I don't think, I don't think that's done um, as a joke. I don't think it's done lightly. I think he, I think uh, Indian lore is something that we, we have the benefit of, of learning and understanding and I will trust that over a lot of uh, opinion, as it were. There's a reason why they pass this along. And, and maybe it would, uh, this is kind of a reach, but maybe they're conditioning us without even knowing it. If you step on this, this is going to happen to you, you know, and then all of a sudden they, the humans figure out, okay, if we go over here, this is going to happen. Because I think I kind of got conditioned when I was out there, you know, sitting here talking with you guys a little bit, thinking about it because I'm licensed. I can carry, you know, I have a 45. Anytime I would take that 45 out of that truck, I would get no action. Mm -hmm. Nothing would happen. Yeah. No they, know. they know. So I quit. Eventually I just quit carrying and then things will continue. So I, you know, sitting here thinking and listening, it's like, they actually conditioned me not, even though they knew I had the gun, conditioned me not to carry that gun because otherwise they weren't going to play right. Maybe that happens with the land where, okay, here's a rock. If you step over the rock, we're going to beat the crap out of you. You stay behind the rock and then nothing happens. So maybe we find that boundary through natural intelligence that we, okay, if we go past the rock, we're going to get beat up. Mm -hmm. so if I take my gun with me, nothing's going to happen. So leave your gun in the truck and then we'll play. Well, I look at it like Val. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the indigenous people have been here for however long. We're talking generations and generations and generations. You know, they are the ones that lived here in America before whoever discovered America. The Vikings, if you want to say Christopher Columbus, then so be it. Whoever, okay? Okay. But they grew up with these things, and they had an understanding. They not only were women and children taken from their tribes and eaten and raped and whatever. This has been passed down. Mm -hmm. It's been written. This is a fact. So Long before that, computers. Yes. Now, now, with that being said, you know, now my family came up across from Germany back in the mid 1800s. The Ottermans, Schlagers, yes, twins, both had 13 kids apiece. Went to New York, one in Pennsylvania, and that's how they started. So, now with that being said, we do not have a long history with whatever you want to call these things. So Daniel Boone in Kentucky shot one and killed one <coughs> with a black powder rifle. That is written in history. Now, why did he shoot one and kill one? I have no idea. But I do not want to take my chance. You know, I would love to study him. I would love to get, I guess, like Brian, as close as I can get. But I'm still fearful. I have no idea. You know, I, I am, I'm very, you know, what do you call it? Curious of the unknown. But am I also in the middle of the woods at night and I hear a snap or a branch or a twig break? And I'm like, don't move. Who was that? Yes, that is me. Especially after watching the video of seeing something that you cannot explain that you've seen out of a movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on. I used to raise big snakes, like reticulated pythons. I had an 18-footer, a uh, couple 16-foot Burmese. And uh, to me right now, I go back to that snake philosophy was, it's not if you're going to get bit. It's just when and how bad is it going to be. You know, I've got a pretty good scar on my arm for where the gentlest retic in the world for 10 years 
could grab any time and all of a sudden out of the blue nailed me <laughs> and 30 some stitches later the snake and i think the same thing may very well happen with these you, they're just unpredictable you don't know the mood they're in uh the one night i went out and it was my first night using a thermal those uh seek thermals that you use on your phone right right and I thought I had it as white being hot. So I'm looking down the, this trail and down the, I'm like, boy, that's a couple of dark gaps in those trees. wonder what that's about. And I'm sitting there looking and looking. All of a sudden the gaps are getting close, bigger and taller. And I'm like, what the heck? And I turned and looked at my truck. I had black as hot because my engine was black. So then I turned back around. Now these things are really close these black objects, I realized that I'm dealing with some two big squatches that are walking up the alley toward me. I get in my truck and hit the brake lights and you could see the two outlines in the two taillights. Yeah, I'm gone. I left. I'm gone. So they are definitely bolder at night. Well, yeah, they use the cover. Right now, Missy, being respectful is the key. They can sense that much more. I'm not saying that's not the case and that's not true. But how many times have you been respectful to somebody and they still stabbed you in the back? And they still talk smacked about you. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah, it's just like everything's good while I'm giving peanut butter, but now, now I'm not giving it what's gonna happen. That was a good guy up until then. Now, now when I went out and had my encounter, absolutely I was I was carrying. It was on my right side and my right side was exposed to the individual in the tree. He seen that there's no doubt in my mind that he didn't see that. My respect for, for it was the fact that, that I was aware of strategy and tactics and, and referring back to Sun Zhu as earlier mentioned. There's a little passage in there about, about <clears throat> picking your battles. Um, you never humiliate your enemy, <clears throat> never, because a humiliated enemy is a dangerous enemy. All I wanted to do was leave. I felt that it was, I felt that it was communicated to me that we had to leave. And that's exactly what I did. And I told Bob Daigle, Bob Daigle, we have to leave. Don't ask me any questions. I don't want to talk. <laughs> I do not want to talk right now. Let's just leave. I do know we paused long enough to take a picture and measure a foot impression outside of that tree line. And uh, I'm going to tell you right now, in my mind, I envisioned a great big something hurling himself out of that tree line on all fours. And if it did, I would I would probably drop right down there with a heart attack or something. I, I did not want to see that. I don't want to see that. And and I wasn't there to harm anything. Anything. I, you know, I don't even hunt anymore. I don't fish anymore. Um, I don't want to hurt living life. I never want to do that. Ever, ever. That's That's my goal in life. Never. I don't want to hurt people's feelings. I don't want to argue with people. I don't want to fight. I don't want to, you know, I've seen enough of that stuff in my lifetime. I don't, I don't want to do that. And it was very important to me to leave. That's what was necessary. That was what I felt I needed to do at the time. And, and looking back in hindsight at that, uh, I, I remember some of the strategy, uh, you know, again, as a chess player, uh, when you, a cornered enemy is a dangerous enemy, even in chess, even in life, even in war, uh, give people dignity, <clears throat> give the Sasquatch dignity where, where it's, it's called for. But again, I've, I've alluded to this earlier t tonight that there are parameters, there are boundaries. 
the, the invisible line, like a threshold of your house. In law, you don't break and enter unless you pass that invisible line that starts at your threshold of your door. You step a foot inside that doorway, breaking that invisible line that everybody should know, you broke the law. That's forced entry. That's breaking and entering. And that's the same way that I look at the Sasquatches and stuff. It gave me the dignity to leave without, without further harassment, unmolested, unharmed. And I was, I was appreciative of that. And um, it took me a long, long time to even consider to going back to that location again because of those experiences and stuff. So th that's what I got to say about that. I'm a firm believer in that. You know, they know when we're a threat. Yes, I do believe that. I do believe with with Brian, what he says. They knew what guns are, firearms, however mm -hmm. you want to call them. I know hunters that, that actually said that they got them in their crosshairs and they were going to drop them. But when they got the crosshairs and the scope onto the face, and they're like, they're, they, they look human. They couldn't pull the trigger. Mm -mm. So what do you say to that? I mean, Thomas Guesswine said, "Good, well said, Val. It's true, missing. Wow, Missy, don't go to bed. We're getting ready to end the show. I well, Missy you, had Missy. a question earlier that I thought was interesting about us, you know, the Squatches being here longer when we talk about them emulating us, but it's like, maybe who taught who to wear hides? You know, are they emulating us that we wore the deer hides or did, you, did we see them wearing it and then we just took off with it on our own? One of the things that Cassidy mentioned uh, in this interview with this, this uh, military man was that according to the Sasquatch, according to the the uh, researcher, um, they prefer to be called Squatch, not Sasquatches, not Bigfoots, not that forest people, none of this stuff. Squatch is what they, they see themselves. Another thing is this. Um, I've heard people say, well, I think their life expect expectancy is, is 40 years or whatever. I don't know. I don't claim to know. I can only say what, what I heard from that interview and it, and it was proposed that that question was asked that Squatch, and he claims at least 300 years. Think about that. These are not, you know, these are not human beings. I'm sorry. They're not, they're not people. They are not people. Um, I don't know, Val. Um, when there's so many rabbit holes we can go down, ladies and gentlemen. It is endless. It really mm -hmm. is. Norma, I agree. Good night, missing. Good night, everybody. I, it's been a heck of a show. I, I enjoyed the show. It was perfect dialogue, Brian. Thank you for yes, coming on, Yes, thank brother. you for coming on, Brian. I really enjoyed it. Thank it. you. I can't thank you both enough because, I mean, you guys have had some heavy hitters in the Bigfoot world, and all of a sudden, here comes the Bat Boy. You know? No, you so, know, you know you're, you're, I really appreciate a chance to tell people, don't do this. It's probably not a good idea. You're a good person, uh, and, and you've, got, you've got an important message to, to share, and, and I think you did it wonderfully tonight. Well, Would you, you agree, Chris? No, oh, I, I totally agree. You know, mm -hmm. I value everybody's opinion, right, wrong, or indifferent. Nobody has the correct answer. Everybody's got their own encounter. Everybody's got their own experiences. Everybody's got their own opinions. That's why we don't judge. Mm -hmm. You know, we say what we think is the proper thing because we know what we hear from other people, like Brian, and we hear what happens to other people that does certain things like Brian has done. And we're just saying, hey, mm -hmm. there are repercussions, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. You may not know it, but it, it does. It happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the statement's true. For every action, there is a reaction. News mm -hmm. cradles, ladies and gentlemen. Google it. Buy one. That's It'll it. entertain you for hours. That's it. It's been a wonderful show, uh, Chris. Yes, it has, ladies and gentlemen, and I loved it. 
And Brian, thank you for coming on. It's been wonderful. Thank you, both. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that time. Wow. Man, have we gone overboard. Take care, Brian. Loved it, man. Chris, Johnny, Hamp, everybody, Norma, Missy, Bama, Denise, Missy. Who else, Chris? Everybody out there. Sean, Johnny, Crazy Witch, I love you all. Been wonderful, man. Wow, what do you think, man? Chris, uh, I think this is this was a a great show. I noticed that there was a lot more uh, comedy. A lot of there had to have been a lot more viewers on here tonight. Some oh, of the names, wait till we get the audio with. uploaded. Yeah, it's gonna be great. It's 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 uh, it's super super. That's what I like. I like spontaneous chat back and forth exceptional i i rate it very high very very good show and it's only gonna get better tammy welcome tammy that's right sean good point Val. it is very so good. absolutely y'all have a good night ladies and gentlemen we'll talk to you soon rock it on good night chris good night val we'll see you right, everybody take care Crazy witch. I love you too, man. Hey, don't forget about the show coming up and in less than a half hour, man. You are not going to believe what Grizzly is getting himself into at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is going to be deep. When I say deep, I'm talking deep, ladies and gentlemen. Flip side of the coin. Yes, Chris. Oh, Lord. Yeah, and it's going to be, oh, Lord, it is. We'll talk to you.